Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today we want to continue our tour through different science topics and explore different fields of related sciences that may turn in useful if you're a researcher in machine learning or pattern recognition. And a particular topic that I'm always interested in is neurobiology. So today I have invited Professor Dr. Holger Schulze from the University Clinic of Erlangen and he wants to tell us a little bit about neurobiology of memory and learning. So Professor Schulze studied biology at the Technical University of Darmstadt, where he graduated and did his PhD on sound processing in the auditory cortex of Mongolian gerbils. In 1996, he moved to the Leibniz Institute for Neurobiology in Magdeburg, where he started his own group and worked on mechanisms of learning and memory in the auditory system. In 2003, he finished his habilitation in physiology at the medical school of the Otto von Guericke University in Magdeburg. In 2007, he followed a call to Erlangen, where he is now an associate professor for experimental autolaryngology. His main research topics are now the neurophysiological mechanisms of hearing, tinnitus, and sleep. So I'm very much looking forward to this presentation and Holger, the stage is yours. for the invitation. Um, so as you, as already has been announced, uh, I will give you some insight into the neurobiology of learning and memory from the perspective of really a biologist. I know that most of you or many of you are into artificial neural networks. And so this is to give you some kind of idea how it works in biological systems. And at some point, I will also try to make some comparisons between information processing, living brains and in also, I'm surely not an expert for, for the second part. But anyway, um, let's start with the talk. So, why should we study the brain at all? So, and especially if you're interested in learning and memory formation. So, just to make an analogy, let's say you would be interested in a system like this, and you want to know how this works, how it drives, how it can move. Just looking at this this car is probably hard to get an idea how it works if you have no idea how this machine inside works. So the motor that is driving um, the car forward. Now, and I think it's pretty similar for a system like this. So if you are interested in learning and you want to study what's happening when, for example, children learn or also animals learn and what kind of neural processes underlie this learning, then it's probably a good idea to also look inside those, those heads and the brains and study the mechanisms that are really working when brains are learning. Right in the beginning, I want to make you aware of the fact that learning is very individual. So we have different types of learners that use different strategies to learn. Uh, we also have good and bad learners for sure, that you know all that from, from your own experiences. And we have some people who um, prefer to learn on their own for example, from a book, but others need a teacher to have a really good learning. Some need auditory information, some are more into visual information. All these kinds of differences are very individual when it comes to learning. And I will detail this a little bit more uh, later through the talk. But first of all, let's have a look at some neurobiological basics. So this is a human brain, you probably all know. And the biggest structure that you may recognize here this, this biggest part here of the brain, this is the so-called neocortex. So this is a structure that in the evolution is very new and it also has grown the most from all the structures in the brain throughout the late evolution. What you also see here is the cerebellum and also a little bit of the brainstem, but really the biggest part here is this neocortex. Um, 
And this is actually the part where we think with, where we learn, where we experience our surroundings. So all this information processing uh, that gets also conscious then finally happens here in this neocortex. If you look a bit inside the brain, then you also see that this is the biggest structure here in the brain. Then you can recognize here the so-called corpus callosum, which is kind of a, a connection between the two halves of the brain. So this is an information line that transfers information from the right brain to the left brain and vice versa. Here again, you see the cerebellum and here the brainstem. Now, some numbers you might know that just in this neocortex, we have about 100 billion neurons. And each of those neurons has connections, synapses, with other neurons, and about 10,000 of those. These synapses are the structures where information is transferred from one neuron to another. So these are really the structures that are important for any kind of information processing. And this is also the reason why learning happens at those synapses. These weights as you might call them, are changed when uh, the system is learning. And as you easily can calculate, so we have like uh, 10 to the order of 15 uh, synapses in the brain, which are individually connected. So it's very clear that this cannot be encoded genetically. The information would be much too high to, for any genetic code. If you think about the combinations you can do with, with such a mass of synapses, um, so the, the brain has somehow to organize itself in response to the surrounding that is around us. And this is the main reason for learning. So to adapt to the environment we are born into. And how this works will be the topic now for the next, well, almost an hour. Okay, let's look a, bit, a little bit deeper into the brain. So this is the functional organization of this neocortex or just cortex. Um, these maps are really already very old, more than 100 years. Um, Mr. Broadman made them from, from dead brains. He looked at and he looked into the structure of the neocortex that you can hear. So this would be the outside, and this is the inside. And there you see that a number of layers from top to bottom here that can be distinguished. Usually in the cortex we have six layers um, and within each layer we have different types of neurons, different numbers of neurons, different types of connections. And Brutman looked into those brains and he recognized that if he looked at different positions inside the cortex, and this is symbolized here with those different symbols, then he found a little bit a change in the, uh, in the set of neurons that he could find there. So denser packed or, or not so densely packed and so on and so forth. And he had the idea that this may be due to different functions that different regions in the cortex um, might be good for. And this is actually, he was very right. So we know today that different regions in the cortex have different functions. Uh, for example, for speech processing, we know, for example, if you now listen to me, then the information first goes to this temporal region here where we have our auditory cortex. So this is the region where auditory information is processed. But then the information is transferred throughout the cortex to other regions. For example, also, if you want to respond to me, to the motor cortex, here the, the premotor cortex, which forms um, a motor program for the muscles you need to move if you want to speak. And also the speech centers here, for example, are also involved. And for example, or if you read, then the occipital cortex, which would be here, would be involved. Uh, in processing visual information. So speech processing is nothing that happens into uh, within one simple processor somewhere in the brain, but it's a combination of different areas that have different uh, subroutines, so to say, for speech processing and uh, speech production. Now let's have a look at the, uh, the basic element of information processing in the brain, which is the neuron. So as every other, um, biological cell, it has a soma or cell body. And in this cell body, you find everything that you find in any other cell, like a, a nucleus or, or mitochondria and so on and so forth. But these neurons are specialized for information processing, which means they need to have structures to take in information. 
like antenna, so to say. This, these are the dendrites that you can see here. So lots of different dendrites that grow out from the cell body. And then there's one specialized uh, part of the cell, which is called the exon, which then transfers the information that is somehow processed here. We will have a look at this to the next cell. And then it reaches low synapses here, where information then is transferred from one cell to another. If you look a little bit closer into the synapse, then you see that it's composed of a presynaptic part and a postsynaptic part, which means the presynaptic part comes from the cell that is sending the information, and the postsynaptic part comes from the cell that is receiving the information. This is here a so-called chemical synapse because information is transmitted not electrically, but chemically. So how does this work? In short, um, an electrical impulse reaches the synapse, and if this electrical pulse reaches the synapse, calcium channels are opened here and calcium flows into the cell. The calcium then is a signal for those vesicle here to fuse with the membrane here close to the synaptic cleft, which is the, the gap between the pre and the postsynaptic side. Within those vesicles, we have a neurotransmitter and the neurotransmitter then diffuses to the other side, to the postsynaptic side, and binds to so-called ligate-gated uh, channels. So these are ion channels that open if the transmitter binds. And if they open, another um, ion, usually it's, it's um, sodium, goes into the cell, leading there to a uh, potential, a positive potential, that is then, again, an electric pulse that can be transferred then across the cell. So we have a, a complex mechanism of electrical activation, chemical transmission, and then again, electrical activation. This is how it looks in, in real life. So this is an electron microscopic picture here where you can see these um, little circles here. Those are the vesicles that contain the transmitter. Here is a synaptic cleft. And here you see this so-called synaptic density, where the proteins that form the ion channels and so on um, are in. Okay. Now, as I said, this was a chemical synapse. We also have, in some cases, the, the much easier, so to say, electrical synapse, where the channels just connect, the channels from the presynapse just connect to the channels of the postsynapse. This is much easier, as I said, uh, than the chemical transmission, but almost all the synapses in the brain are indeed chemical synapses. Why is that so? So if you want to have information processing, then it's really important that you have a sending side and the receiving side. So the direction of information flow can be defined by a chemical synapse. It cannot be defined by an electrical synapse. So as you can see here, ions can flow from side A to B and vice versa. So these synapses, we only very rarely find where extremely fast information transmission is needed. But usually, whenever it comes um, to normal, so to say, information processing, um, then we have those chemical synapses here. Besides the fact that the direction is defined of information flow, also such chemical synaps synapses can be modified uh, by other transmitters than the primary transmitter or modulators that bind to the synapse and strengthen or weaken the transmission. So this is also a mechanism to change the flow of information um, due to certain circumstances. Now, how can the flow of information be controlled in this kind of um, neuronal networks. This depends actually where the synapses are relative to the cell body and the dendrites and the axons. So everything you could imagine is also realized actually by nature. So we have some um, axosecretory, we call them, synapses where the synapse releases its transmitter into the bloodstream. So these would be hormones then. Um, but in our context, more important are the, um, these axo-axonic. So this is where the synapse is attached to another axon. We also have axodendritic. So the synapse goes to a dendrite. This is actually the 
so to say, the standard um, type of connection. In some rare cases, we also have extra extracellular, where the transmitter is just released into the extracellular fluid, but this is also a rare case. But also pretty often we find axosomatic or axosynaptic connections, where the presynapse connects to another presynapse or to the soma. So if we have this toolbox, then how can information flow be controlled? Let's take this example here of an axo-axonic synapse. So let's say this synaptic neuron here would be activated and then there would be an excellent potential, so electrical activation that runs along the axon here and finally reaches this other cell. If this synapse here is silent, then this works as I just described. So the information travels along the axon, reaches another cell, and then there's chemical transmission. But if this would be, for example, an inhibitory synapse, meaning that it blocks the flow of information, then the connection between this and this neuron could be functionally disconnected just by activated an inhibitory neuron here. On the other hand, if it would be an excitatory neuron, then the connection could be strengthened because then it would be more likely that any activation that reaches this neuron would actually activate the synapse and then goes on uh, through the network. And by a combination of all those types of synapses and the location relative to the soma of the perceiving or the receiving neuron, you can um, control the flow of information for the type of information processing that is needed at that moment. And this can all be done without learning. So this is all without changing anything at the level of the synapse. This is just activating or non-activating certain synapses to control flow of information. Another example, what we can do with the kind of connection that we have between those neurons via the synapses is the formation of associations. And there we have a phenomenon which we call spatial or temporal summation um, of the inputs from certain neurons. So again, let's say we have a neuron here and we would record the activity in this neuron and we have two inputs. The EPSP um, is an excitatory postsynaptic potential, though this is the kind of activation that is elicited by uh, a certain um, excitatory synapse. And we have two of those. And if we now activate one of those synapses, then we can record here the EPSP, which would be just a little depolarization here. And then this fades off again as a function of time. And if there's a certain time delay between the activation of these two synapses, then you see that we also see those two um, EPSPs here. On the other hand, if there's a very short time delay so that the second EPSP comes before the first one has faded out, then we get a summation of these potentials, meaning that EPSP1 and EPSP2 are summed up to result in a stronger depolarization of the unit. And as you probably already know, uh, the, the units fire if a certain threshold is reached. So let's say the threshold would be minus 50 millivolt, for example, like it's, it's shown here. Then a single EPSP at one of those synapses would not be enough to activate the postsynaptic neuron. But the summation of two EPSPs would be strong enough to cross the threshold of minus 50 millivolt so that then this postsynaptic neuron would fire an action potential that then reaches the rest of the network. This can be done by temporal summation, as I have just described here. It can also be done by spatial summation. So if you have lots of synapses here that fire at the same time or uh, closely together, then you will also get this kind of uh, summation of EPSPs. And by that, um, the cells can build associations. So for example, if two items belong together and you want to, you want to yeah, you want to see um, if both items are present at the same time, then such a neuron could actually signal if both items are present at the same time, because only then you would reach the threshold here. If only 
one item is present at a, at a time, you would not reach a threshold and there would be no activation of the postsynaptic neuron. I will give an, a clearer example in a minute. But keep in mind, by this kind of connections here, uh, the neural networks can form associations between items. Now we get a forced glance at learning mechanisms. So as I said, any learning has to change the transmission at the level of the synapse. And one mechanism that is described there is a so-called long-term potentiation. So what does that mean? This is a presynapse, this is the postsynapse, and we have different receptors here in the postsynapse for an excitatory transmitter, which in this case is glutamate. So if glutamate is released here, it will move to the postsynaptic side, it will bind, let's say, to the AMPA receptors, and if it binds here, the channel will open and calcium will go in. Um, not much will, will happen here because this, this AMPA receptor is not very good for calcium, it's better for sodium and also potassium. So it will produce an EPSP, but only if a very strong EPSP is produced, let's say by a multiple activation of the presynapse, then we get a strong depolarization at the postsynapse, which will lead to a release of magnesium, which blocks another type of channels, the so-called NMDA receptors. The NMDA receptors can then be opened also by glutamate, but only after a strong activation by, by the other receptors. And then a strong calcium influx happens. And the calcium then again is a signal for a number of mechanisms. I don't want to go into detail in, in this context here, but for example, um, it will activate um, the CAM kinase 2, which then phosphorylates the AMPA receptor, which makes the AMPA receptor more sensible to glutamate, which means that in the next cycle, when again glutamate is released, this will respond more sensitive to the signal from the presynapse. So it strengthens the mechanism to strengthen the transmission between those two neurons. And by this, the learning path can be, um, can be formed. Okay, and this is just to show you a few examples of different types of neurons. You see that the morphology of different neurons is very, can, be, can be very different. So we can have uh, neurons that have more or less long um, and single dendrites, and others have large trees of dendrites here. So this means that such a neuron would collect information of a large area, let's say in, in, in this time it's a Purkinje cell in the cerebellar cortex, so in the cerebellum. So this integrates information over large areas, whereas this would be very specific to perhaps just a few neurons that uh, give input to this, to this cell here. Now, the first little comparison to artificial neural networks. So how can we model this type of information processing here? As I said, we have the dendrites that are the inputs to the cell. Um, then we have some computing here. The computing basically is uh, the threshold that, is, that, that you need to reach to activate the cell and um, trigger an action potential. And then we have the output number of axon terminals as they are called where the synapses to the next cells are. Now you, you all probably know this, this classical model of the mccullough pitts neuron. This actually does exactly this. So you have a number of inputs, you have a threshold and this then uh, you sum up and have a threshold and then you decide um, if there will be uh, information transmitted to, to the next neurons. Uh, or a little bit more sophisticated, a number of inputs, a number of weights, which is important. In the, with reference to the cell, these weights could be the strength of an individual synapse, as I have just described before and after an, a long-term potentiation, for example. It could also be the position within this dendritic tree here. So if you have a, a synapse which is closer to the soma, it will have more impact on what happens in the cell. And if you have a synapse that is far away on the dendritic tree, then the EPSP would have to travel a long way to reach the soma and by that would weaken, so it would have only little impact on the summation that happens then here uh, on the soma. And then you have, as I said, a threshold and 
action potentials go to the output. Now, if you look at simple neural networks that you all know better than I do, um, you, for example, could have a little network here with an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. And, and this is an, a simple feed-forward network. So from one layer to another, there's information flow. But in, in this example here, there's no information flow back. And there's especially also no information flow between neurons within a layer. And this is really very artificial because this, this probably never happens in a biological system. So in a biological system, you would always have, um, for example, lateral inhibition between um, neurons within a layer. And, and you would also always have uh, feedback loops um, within, the, within the, uh, such a network. But again, you would also have these for, for all of those synapses here, you would have your weights as you know it from your models. So it is somehow realistic because the elements you use are comparable to the neurons, but the complexity of the network, at least in this example here, is much lower than we know it from biological system. And the complexity of the network is actually what is deciding about how powerful such a network is, how powerful cognition can be so and, and also how much can be learned this all depends not so much on the number of neurons but on the complexity of the network the complexity of the connections between the neurons okay so to sum this little uh, neurobiology basics up um, i have some take-home messages for you these are not the last ones so the first one would be the different brain regions are specialized for different functions Neurons communicate via synapses. The synapses control the flow of information between neurons and learning changes the flow of information via modification of synaptic contacts. Okay, now let's come to learning. I have shown you here this guy because you, you must be aware that most of the data I can present you are from animal experiments, so not not necessarily apes, most of the science is done in mice and other rodents, um, but still the, the basic mechanisms, mechanisms, how the brains work, how learning works, how synapses change their weights uh, during learning. This is all very conserved throughout the evolution. Um, and this is why we, we can use animals to study those mechanisms and we need to use animals because we cannot really look into living human brains uh, without destroying them. <laughs> and uh, as nobody wants that, so we, we rely really on those animal experience. This is the first example of one of those experiments I brought to you. And this is also the very first um, learning mechanism that happens in, in our brains, or I have to say happened before, because this is only something that happens in children um, up to the end of puberty, um, but most of it in, in really young children. So, and, and this is called imprinting. So what's imprinting? The example I brought to you here is uh, learning how mom's voice calls. And these are actually two neurons from two different chicken. Um, and the difference you can see probably is that the neuron on the right here has lots of those little spines here on the dendrites. This is where the synapses are located. And this neuron on the left here has only a few number of spines or much less number of spines. So it has less synaptic contacts with other neurons. Now, this neuron or one neuron was taken from uh, a chicken that, were, that just left the egg and didn't have any experience of sound. The other chicken heard the voice of its mother. So it had some acoustic experience and could learn how the voice of the mother sounds, which is, as you might imagine, very, very important um, for basically any organism um, to learn how the voice uh, of the mother sounds because there is nature, uh, there's food, there's safety, and so on and so forth. So this is something, the imprinting, where the first presentation of the sound is really learned very good and will never be forgotten throughout the whole life. Now, as I said, one cell is from uh, the chicken that learned the sound and the other one is from the chicken that did not learn the sound. So usually if this would not, wouldn't be online, I would ask, but you might uh, type in the chat if you want. Um, what do you think? 
which neuron learned, the one with lots of synapses or the one with less synapses? Which one did learn something? Okay, the first is lots less. Okay, both, both opinions. That's good. So actually, if I give this, this talk, most people think the, the neuron with lots of synapses is the one that learned, but actually it's really the other one. So why is that so? You must imagine if a chicken or a child is born, then it doesn't know how the world around it does look like, how it sounds, what kind of information there is that has to be processed. So first of all, brains have to be able to perceive basically everything that is around us. But then it's the first time the mother really talks. And then from all these synapses here that have been built, only a few will be activated, namely those that transfer the information of the sound of the mother. And imprinting then means all those synapses here that are activated are perce uh, perceived and all the others will die. So all the others go away. Uh, and by that you come to this neuron here that did hear us here in quotes, a sound, um, and has learned how the mom, how mom's voice sounds. And now you also can see why the structure of the network really contains the information about something. Because the next time the mother will talk, this neuron will be activated because all those synapses that transfer the information about the sound of the voice are still there. But if any other sound is heard, the neuron will not be activated anymore because the synapses that would have been needed to transfer this sound are gone. So what we have then is a filter that will only respond if the sound that has been imprinted is perceived again and not when any other sound is heard. So this is just a scheme to illustrate that. So we have sensory filters for basically everything that we experience in our early life. And there might be, in the visual case, might be filters for um, tree angles, for example. So the tree angle would fit in here, but, but not the square or star. But we have other neurons that are special, specialized to other features uh, of, of the world around us. So everything that is perceived early is also somehow represented in the filters that develop um, as a function of the information that goes into the brains. And this is what I said in the very beginning. The, the brains optimize their information processing to the world around us because it cannot be determined genetically what will be there. So if we would be born on a different planet that sounds differently, smells, tells, uh, looks differently, we still could adopt our brains to this different environment without having any genetical changes. It's just experience dependent how these sensory filters look like. So why do I show you this? There is another thing that really influences our perception. And I don't know if you have already seen it. So it's only the girl on the picture. And if you still haven't seen it, uh, there's only King Kong here on the side. So. This is the phenomenon with, that we call selective attention. So not only what the sensory filters take from our surroundings and let it into our brain is important, but also the attention we give to different objects. And what is important and where attention should be focused to also depends on the experience we had and was what we decided to be important or not. I suppose that probably also King Kong would be pretty important if you would really uh, see one outside, but anyway, probably you didn't see it in the very first moment, and this is selective attention. So this means that our model of the world around us is only a very small fraction of what is actually out there. So what we consciously perceive is only a very small fraction that is led through first by our sensory filters and then by our cognitive filters that decide what is relevant or what, and what is not relevant at a given point in time. Now, 
the example with the chicken was, was probably nice, but uh, you may ask, is this similar in humans? So let's have a look at the maturation of the human cortex. So this is here um, from a human cortex, for example, of a newborn. You see that almost all the, or well, all the neurons are already there, but the connections are really sparse. So there are only little connections between the neurons in the neocortex. If then the brain matures, you see that more and more connections are built up to the age of about two years where you have massive connections between all kinds of neurons in the neocortex of the human brain. So this looks like the exact opposite of what I have told you with the chickens, but this is not because the mechanism is really different. This is because the development in the, in the human brain takes much longer than in the chicken brain. Because after the age of about two, two and a half years, what happens is what we call synaptic pruning. And this is exactly what, what I have shown you in the chicken brain. So depending on what kind of experience a child has, how many different sensory experiences it may, um, it may have, um, it, will, it will have more or less synaptic context in its neocortex. So if you have a very rich world around you, then you will need to process many different experiences. Then you need lots of different synaptic connections. But if you have a really boring world around you, then many much um, of these synaptic contexts that had been there at the age of two will degenerate so that you then would have a network that has only little connections compared to a, let's say, healthy brain. Use it or lose it. This is uh, the kind of sentence that you can, uh, that you can also use for this kind of um, development here or maturation. So everything that is needed and that is active through the maturation process will stay and everything that is not active will go away. Yeah, how do neurons connect? Just to make this um, a little bit more clear. So this here um, is the public transport plan of Erlangen. And I, I would call this a healthy uh, connection. So here is a central station, for example, and you see most of the bus lines and so on. They all meet here at the, at the central station. So this is obviously a very important point to transfer something, in our case, information. And But there are other areas here in, in, in the surroundings where you still have some kind of connection but it's, it's a little bit uh, less dense than here in the center. But if we compare this, let's say, to the subway plane of Nuremberg, you see this is really sparse. So you still have most of connections at the central station. But then if you go uh, to Bamberg or to Roth, then you see there's nothing else. So if you want to go from Roth to Bamberg, then you have to take a long way through here, the central station, or if you want to go from Roth to Neumark, there's also no direct connection. You have to go across the central station. So that means everything that gets lost during the development is really hard to get back, if at all. So if you haven't learned it when you are, when you are young, it's very hard um, if you have to rely on, on such a network here. So, the important thing or the important message I want to transfer here is that during the early development, this is the real, the most important time um, for child development, which means the child's need to have as much experiences of many different things as they could to get a really healthy and highly connected network in their brains. And this is what they have to rely on when they are adults. And if you, if you miss something during that time, then you might end up with such a network which then makes it really hard for some tasks um, um, for the adults and, and, and also for learning new things is much more easier if you have such a network compared to such a network. Let me illustrate this a little bit more. Um, we go to more complex filters in the visual system. Um, in the visual system, we have something that we call orientation selectivity. What, what is that? So let's say we have a number of neurons in, in the retina, in the eye, and these stand for, let's say, pixels of the picture that is seen. Um, and now we could connect, let's say, these few neurons to the blue one, and we could make the weights of the synapses here 
so that only if all these three neurons are activated at the same time, think about the temporal summation I've, uh, I've explained, then only then this blue neuron here would be activated. This would then be a filter for a stimulus that has a, a virtual um, orientation, a vertical orientation. At the, in the same way, you could connect these three neurons to the yellow one, and this would be then sensitive to horizontal lines in the visual field. And indeed, if you record, let's say, in cats, for example, from the primary visual cortex, then you will find neurons that respond, let's say, to a vertical line, but not at all to a horizontal line. But this, again, is experience-dependently developed in, in the early life. Now, if you would raise a cat like this, this is an experiment that has been done in the 70s. So you would raise a cat like this, and it would also make an experiment during a critical period of its development. This is a short period in the cat of about two weeks. So if the cat would only have experience of those vertical lines, and you would then record in the visual cortex of this cat, then you would only find neurons that respond to structures that are about vertical in the visual field, which means as there are no horizontal elements in the world around this cat, there is no need to have neurons that respond to horizontal items in the world. So again, the brain adapts to the world around it. But the problem with those critical periods is that then the imprinting is finished and it cannot be learned anymore if after this critical period, the cat would now experience horizontal lines. So if it would go through, let's say, um, uh, uh, like sticks, vertical sticks, it, it could move around there. But if you would have horizontal sticks within the room, the cat would move against it because it wouldn't see it. Although the eyes are completely okay, physiologically but the brain cannot perceive it anymore because the neurons, the, the, the filters that would be needed to perceive horizontal structures are not there anymore. Now, again, this was an animal experiment. Do we have examples in humans? You probably all know the experiments of, of for example, Chinese people who have problems to distinguish between R and L phonemes. And this is not because they, they don't want to. This is because if they were raised in China, then in, this, in their language, there is no differentiation between those two phonemes, R and L, which means that if you speak to them, they do not have different new filters, neurons, for R and L, but R and L, that as we speak it, activate the same neurons in their brains. And this is why they cannot distinguish it, no matter how often you, uh, you talk to them. And the reason for that is that when the critical periods end, um, then the so-called perineuronal nets, this is a structure that is around, that surrounds the neurons, stabilizes, and it has holes where the synapses are located. So this mechanism stabilizes the synapses where they are. This has the advantage that something that is learned by imprinting mother's voice will never be forgotten because the synapses are really stable there. But if you want to learn something new, you, need, you would need new synapses at another place. There is no space anymore because the, neural, uh, the perineuronal net is there and, um, and a new synapse cannot be formed anymore at, at this particular place. So this is an, an, um, a mechanism that is really important to preserve the outcome of the imprinting process. And this is why it's so stable. So again, some take home messages. Until the end of puberty, learning not only stores information, but also structures the immature brain. This structure then sets the basis for adult learning capabilities. So this is a really important part of our personal development. In cortex, this process starts at about age two and a half and is most active during kindergarten. The result of the processes are filters of perception, which are highly individual, depending on everyone's unique experience. So no two humans have the exact same experiences. This is why no two humans, even twins, um, would have the same brains. So everybody has its own model of the world.
in its head. Now, the good news is that we still can learn, even if we are adults. Um, and the first thing the information goes into the brain is a so-called working memory or short-term memory. This is located in the prefrontal cortex. This is here, so this is right in front of your head. So the prefrontal cortex <clears throat> uh, of a macaque monkey in this case. And I've shown experiments in macaque monkeys where they had the task they should fixate uh, a screen and then for half a second, somewhere on the screen, a dot would show up and the monkey would have to memorize where the dot was for four and a half seconds. And after that, it would have to press the screen, it was a touch screen, where the dot has been. So this is a short-term memory task. And then um, the group uh, of uh, Goldman Rakic, they recorded in the prefrontal cortex of macaque monkeys and they found two different types of neurons. The first neuron type of neurons, they responded when the dot was displayed. So this is nothing special. This is something we also know from the visual cortex where we have visual filters that are activated if something is seen. So no big deal. Below here, there are neurons that respond when the movement is made. So again, no big deal. We also see this in motor cortex where neurons are active if movements are executed. But interesting are these neurons here, this type in the middle. So these neurons, they increased the activity when the, the dot wasn't there anymore. And then they were active as long um, as the monkey had to wait before it could execute its movement. So this is electrical activation of units in the prefrontal cortex, which is active as long as the information has to be kept. And this is the working memory. So working memory is simple. Uh, maintained electrical activation. This is in terms of energy consumption costly, but it does not need already changes in synapses, connections, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, now we have this information in the, in the working memory, but we, if you really want to learn something, we have to transfer the information from the short-term memory into the long-term memory. And before I explain how this happens in, in brains, I want to make one point clear, which is a fundamental difference between information processing in brains and in computers. So um, in brains, so this is the information processing machine that, that the humans have, uh, and in computers, we have this fundamental difference. In the brains, processing of information is done by the neurons but the storing of information is also done by the neurons, namely by change in the synaptic context. As you probably know, uh, in computers, this is very different because processing and storing happens on different types of elements, different the processor and, and, and the RAM chips, for example. Now, because the brains are doing both with neurons, this has the advantage that the, um, the memory is never very really full. Like in the computer, if, if your memory is full, you, you need some more chips or you, you buy another machine. But in the brains, you can already, you can always store more information by increasing the complexity of the network. But the disadvantage of the system is that if storing and processing happen at the same time on the same neurons, these two processes can interfere with one another. So if information has to be stored while new information has to be processed, this doesn't work really well. So then the, the storage is disturbed. We start with the classical conditioning. You probably know Pavlov experiments with a dog. So where he measured um, the salivation of the dog when he presented food to the dog. Um, how does the classical conditioning work? And this works by the so-called Herbian learning rule that you probably all also know. So in the Herbian learning rule, we have we need at least to explain it three neurons. One that codes, let's say via sensory filter, for the so-called unconditioned stimulus, the UCS. Um, 
and we have a neuron that controls the reaction of the dog and we have a neuron um, that codes for another stimulus. So let's start. Let's say the dog sees some food. It will show a reaction. In this case, um, the salivation of the dog, as you can see here. This is a reaction that is not learned. So this is what happens spontaneously. If you present another stimulus that has not been learned in any context uh, before, uh, for example, the bell ring, as Pavlov did, then you will see no reaction. Now what Pavlov did was he paired the two stimuli with each other. So he presented the food and at the same time rang the bell. And then the dog showed a reaction for sure. This is clear because the, the unconditioned stimulus is there, so the reaction is there. But if he did, uh, when he did this for a few times, then what happened was there was a change in this synapse here. This is how you can explain the phenomenon of classical condition. This synapse was strengthened by this type of experiment. And the Hebbian rule is a synapse is strengthened when both the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron are activated at the same time. So then, and this is the case because both stimuli are there and the reaction is there. And then the synapse is strengthened, which means that if only the bell rings, then this synapse here is strong enough to still lead to a reaction in the dog, which means the dog has learned the association that food is, has something to do with the bell stimulus. And the dog will always come to get some food if now the bell uh, rings. So we could say the Hebbian rule is fire together, wire together. Now for the last 10 minutes or so, I will come to some experiments we did in, in, in the labs I've been. Um, you already heard that I worked lots with Mongolian gerbils that you can hear, see here, and they have an auditory cortex that looks like this. It has a number of different fields here. Um, the symbols represent, again, sensory filters that code in this uh, case for frequencies. So here would be low frequencies, and here would be high frequencies. And these different lines are a little bit like a keyboard that you could play, so with low tones here and high tones there. And in other fields, you, you find similar representations. Now, we did the following experiment. I have to turn up the volume a little bit here. We did the following experiment. Um, the gerbil sat in such a shuttle, shuttle box, and he has to learn to jump over the hurdle here if one particular sound, um, in this case, an amplitude modulated sound was played, and he should stay on his side when another amplitude modulated sound was played. Um, so an amplitude modulation means there is a, a carrier frequency here in blue, and this is modulated in amplitude with another sinusoid, which you can see here in red, the so-called modulation frequency. Now, I play you those two sounds. I hope you can hear it. This would be one sound, and this is the other sound. I don't know if you heard the difference. So these two sounds sound pretty similar because the carrier frequency was the same, which means the pitch was the same, but one was modulated with 20 hertz and the other one with 40 hertz. So the one is a little bit rougher than the other. I hope you heard that. Now, if we train the animals to learn this, then this goes pretty fast. These are the so-called conditioned responses. So the jumps across the hurdle, blue is to the sound where they should jump and red was to the sound where they should not jump. And you see that at the first day of training, um, the animals could not distinguish between the sounds. At the second day, they were already pretty good. And at the third day, they were almost at 100% performance. Now, if you do this and you inject anisomycin into the auditory cortex, anisomycin is a blocker of protein biosynthesis. Then you find the following. So this would be the difference between those two curves that you saw before, though this means that if the, the function here goes up, there was a learning, the learning performance got better. And if it's no rise here, then there is no improvement in learning. So 
the black dots are the unisomycin injections and the, the white dots are the goals. See in the control group, there is learning, but there was no further learning after the unisomycin injection. And as I said, the unisomycin blocks protein in biosynthesis, so it blocks the transfer of information from the short-term memory into the long-term memory, which means that for the formation of long-term memory, you need protein synthesis, new um, channel proteins, and so on, to modify synapses that are involved in the learning. Not block what already been learned. So there's also an improvement into, in the short-term memory, but if you then test at the next day, the information has not found its way into the long-term memory. So there's no improvement in the task. So blocking protein synthesis does not disrupt existing memories, but it prevents storing of new information in the long-term memory. The problem is that the, this biosynthesis of proteins takes about 24 hours. And I said before that these two processes of um, storing information and processing new information can interfere with each other. So if, for example, a child has to learn something in the school, um, let's say from, from uh, in, in the morning, and then in the afternoon, it, it looks television for hours. Then the television means that there's a lot of stimulus satiation that goes into the system. And this is too much information that then interferes with the storage of the information that, let's say, um, should be learned for school. So these processes really interfere, and this is important. And as it takes 24 hours, um, it's not only important for the success of learning, what you do while you are learning, but it's also important what you do the 24 hours after you try to learn something. Transfer of information from short into long-term memory relies protein synthesis and follows selection criteria that, that cannot be consciously controlled. This is a problem. Uh, I think I didn't mention that. There's two to save much what is stored and what is not stored. The transfer of information from short to long-term memory takes at least 24 hours and repetition and redundancy foster the storage of information. The stimulus satiation disrupts it it massively. Okay, and then in the last few minutes, some more details about higher cognitive functions of learning. So if you think of uh, the neuroplasticity then in the long-term memory, um, let's talk about the transfer and category formation. So category formation is something which is really uh, an important mechanism to reduce the amount of information that has to be stored. So for example, if you go into a room and there are a number of chairs, you, you immediately recognize what are the chairs and what are the tables, even though if you never saw these particular chairs and tables. This is because you have an abstract category in your brain of how a chair should look like and how a table should look like. And you don't have to be aware of this particular item, which is actually there. So you don't have to learn all the possible chairs you ever have seen. You just have to remember this abstract concept of a chair. Now, in the animal experiments, this looks like this. So we trained our animals, as I've shown you, with those amplitude modulations. And the first thing that you see is if you train to, let's say, low best modulation frequencies, and after the learning, you have more neurons that code now for those um, best modulation frequencies that have been relevant in the learning, and you have less neurons that code to other modulation frequencies. Interestingly, if you look in the brain and look at the neurons that actually change their preferred best modulation frequency, that they change their filter characteristics, then it looks like this. So, the gray area here would be the, the surface of the cortex, of the auditory cortex, and then the bars here uh, refer to the best modulation frequency, so a long bar, higher best modulation frequency, short bar, lower best modulation frequency, and before the learning you see that there's no order at all. So this, this seems completely um, not arranged in, in any um, systematic way. But after the learning, you see that there's one stripe of neurons here that now all code for low modulation frequencies. These are those modulation frequencies um, that were used in the training, and they are not somewhere, but they are on the so-called two kilohertz isofrequency contour, was the carrier frequency in our training paradigm. So there was the pitch that you heard when I played the sounds. So that means 
that only those units change their preferred temporal structure, the modulation frequency of the sound, that are already tuned to the spectral um, content of the sound, the two kilohertz. So it's very, the learning is very specific in the first place to the stimuli. So this is not categorization, this is just learning of a particular stimulus. If you now want to categorize something, then you have to present different prototypes for the category. So this is done by a colleague here, Frank Ohl in Magdeburg. So he presented now frequency modulations. This is where the pitch rises or falls in time. And you can do this in different frequency ranges and different steepness here of the pitch change. And he presented uh, the first pair, for example, then the gerbils need a few days to learn that. And then he present another pair. And then they have to start learning again because by now they only have learned those explicit um, stimuli. So he presents number two, they had to learn again. But then at some point you present the new pair of stimuli and they know what they have to do right away. Although they never heard this particular pair of frequency modulations before. And this is how it looked for different individuals. So for example, this is now the, the discrimination performance in the learning experiment and a long bar means in the first session, this was a performance in the first session with a new stimuli. So if you have a high um, percentage here, then that means that they knew what to do already in the first session with a new pair. So this mouse here needed six different pairs. This one only four, and this one only five, and this even only three. So you could say this was the dumb mouse and this was the clever mouse. But anyway, learning is individual, as I said, and it also depends on the learning method. So another paradigm might have been looked differently, but the important thing is what you see here is a transition from associative learning to category learning, which happens abruptly and discontinuously for each subject at an individual point in time, the individual aha moment, as we say. And this aha moment is also important for, for the last point I will make in a minute. Okay, so this means um, that, for example, this mouse here who did do the categorization in, um, in the last and the sixth training block, <clears throat> you see that after between five and six training blocks, the patterns got very similar. And you also see this here between three and four, the patterns got really similar. And here it's even earlier between two and three. The patterns get similar within a category and they get very dissimilar between categories. So the neurophysiological correlate of this category is a certain pattern of activation auditory cortex. And if something is similar to this kind of pattern, then the category is recognized. And if you have another pattern, this might belong to a different category of perception. So take home messages, the learning induced neuronal plasticity is highly specific with respect to learned items. The transfer of knowledge needs category learning. Formation of categories does not, ha not happen continuously, but abruptly at an individual point in time for the learning subject, the aha moment. And when the aha moment happens, when the aha moment happens, um, may depend on the learning method. For different subjects, different learning methods may be optimal. Last two slides, dopamine and motivation, which, which is really an important point. So we do the same experiment again in the, our shuttle box and we measure the amount of dopamine, which is another neurotransmitter in the prefrontal cortex. There is a baseline of 100%. So this, this first line here at 100% is measured before the training starts. So before the animal learns something. Then the training starts, it takes a few trials, but then comes the point where the animal learns that it has to, um, what the task is that it has to do. And when this aha moment occurs, then the dopamine in the prefrontal cortex rises massively, as you can see here in the second curve. Now the dopamine has two functions. The first is it makes a real good feeling. So if you have a success in solving a problem, this makes a real good feeling. And at the same time, it fosters the transfer of information into the long-term memory, which is, makes completely sense. So that means 
when you have to repeat something that you already know, you don't get a reward of dopamine. So the dopamine is the internal reward system of the brain. The brain rewards itself for success in problem solving. And if you don't have to solve a problem because you know how to solve students, um, this is the reason why they often have bad, bad notes because it's no success to do something that you that is really easy for you. On the other hand, if a task is too hard, then this might happen, the so-called learned helplessness. If a task is so hard that you never have success in solving it, learned helplessness of the animal or student then learns that is just not clever enough for the task and this may lead then to burnout. So it's really important in learning that you have your aha moments, your success moments from time to time to get the dopamine, to foster the learning and, and to strengthen the storage of information in your brain. Last take home messages. So the brain rewards itself for achievements in comprehending and problem solving. The transmitter dopamine not only causes blissful feelings, but also fosters the storage of information in long-term memory. And with this, I hope I could show you a little bit about the neurobiology of learning and give you some ideas how brains do the task. And um, I thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. So I even do have some applause for you. <laughs> thank you. So I would like to ask everybody to type down the questions in the chat. So I also had a couple of questions. So maybe I start with those and um, then people can still type the questions into the chat. So one thing that I always find interesting that every neuron is always de depicted only with a single axon. Is this, uh, is this really true uh, or is this for simplification or uh, are there alterations in different cell times? No, it's, it's, it's true. <laughs> uh, so. But um, if, if you look, uh, let's see, where, have, where do I have the neuron? Um, here, for example, you can see it. So usually um, you have one axon, but then you have a number of connections at the end of the axon. So this is, if you, if you more or less the same, um, this, if you would have a number of axons. So it, uh, there is a spreading here of, uh, um, of this axonal terminal with a number of different axons. It, this could also be sometimes um, a longer path, which then would be called an axon collateral. So they all have the same origin, but then you know, it can divide into certain axon collaterals that then reach also different neurons for sure. Cool. So, I mean, technically axons can also be very short and then you can yes. directly connect to be them. very short, but they can also be like uh, yeah, a meter long. If you think of motor axons, which are in, in your spine and reach, let's say, their toe, um, they, they can be really long. Uh -huh. Oh, interesting. Uh, also, a question that I was interested in is, uh, what do you think about the Neuralink project by Elon Musk? Is, is this something where, I mean, he's, he's essentially saying that with the new interfaces and the high density that he achieves with the, I believe, 1,000 yeah. electrodes per, per square centimeter, that you can soon upload and uh, copy entire brains and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. I, I mean... Um... So first of all, um, I, I don't want to be uh, now a little bit uh, against the engineers, but I think he is in, in this kind of really bad example for an engineer because as far as I uh, heard or read also, he said that um, he did, in, in his team, he doesn't need any, anyone who really has knowledge about the neuroscience and neurons and the biology of everything. But this is kind of, a, for me, a black box thinking. Um, so, so the engineer does it and he doesn't need knowledge and I mean the, the whole session we do right now is to give you some knowledge about the neurobiology and, I, and I'm sure that this is helpful um, to see how neurons connect also how the networks we didn't talk too much about networks today about how complex networks can be and what kind of information processing algorithms can be implemented in these types of uh, networks I think this is really helpful if you want to do your, your um, modeling um, the modeling must in the end work, I agree. It, it does not be uh, a one-by-one one copy of the real world, but still nature was really inventing a lot of things. And uh, yeah, the bottom line is, I think the, the, this is bullshit, the project. <laughs>
<laughs> it's a very clear. I really, I really like Elon Musk, and I really have lots of respect for many projects he did with SpaceX or whatever. But I think this part right now is still bullshit. And interestingly, that you only think it about the project that you are an expert in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, but you're essentially saying uh, one day in the library has saves uh, weeks and months of experimentation, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we have more questions. So Florian was asking, is it possible to have endless excitation cycles, say between two or three neurons or groups of neurons? And could that happen at least in artificial cells if neurons are connected within one layer with the previous layer? So... Does that happen? In principle, yes. Um, uh, but, but this is pathology. So you see this in principle in epileptic seizures. So this is where you have circling excitation, for example, in a certain uh, brain region, or if you have a grand mal, um, this may also swap from one side to the other side, back and forth. And this only stops by exhausting of the neurons. Um, and also massively the neurons then die because of exhausting because so, so the, the, the metabolites that they need for energy consumption they go really down at some point so and, and this is then when the cycle ends mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but this is really pathology so this shouldn't happen yeah maybe that also answers the follow-up question and um, this is is really a pretty bad situation. Say imprinting, does that only happen in the early stages of life or is there also situations in life where, where you can get imprinted? So uh, no, this is really uh, only in the in the early life. So as I said, the, the most happens there in the very young ages between two and a half and let's say six, six seven or so. And it ends with the end of puberty. By the end of puberty, you have a complete mature brain and all the imprinting mechanisms. So different systems uh, mature at different times in development, but uh, by the end of puberty, this is definitely over. Um, interestingly, there are now some, uh, some experiments where people try to, to make new holes in this um, perineuronal net that I have shown you that stabilizes this, um, those neuronal contexts, these, these synapses between the neurons. Um, and if you, if you really make new holes with enzymes, you can do that. Then you can, at least in an animal experiments, you can have imprinting like learning phenomena again. Mm -hmm. um, so this is pretty interesting. And this may at some point lead also to, to some kind of therapy, for example, um, for yeah for the chinese who wants to learn <laughs> the r and l perhaps um but there are also so. pathologies if for example uh people who um who have really disparate eyes they they um they cannot have a, a three-dimensional vision for example and this if, if you don't um correct the eyes um during the critical periods then even if you are grown up and your eyes are in principle, okay, you will never see a three-dimensional picture. This is also because of this kind of uh, mm -hmm. imprinting. Um, and this, for example, might be uh, some people where such a uh, such a therapy would really help. But um, beyond that, so for the new normal biology, yes, it's only active during development. Yeah, I was thinking about, you know, extreme events that can traumatize people for, it's just one moment that you experience, but it was so extreme that you will remember it for essentially the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't have to be a negative experience. It can be also a very positive one. Like when you meet this, your own child the first time. Yeah, I mean, this unfortunately can also happen uh, for an, to an adult. So those traumatizing events, um, this then has to do a lot with, with the limbic system and uh, emotional learning. So there, this is the, the one exception where this one try learning also can happen uh, in adult brains. For example, if you have a traumatic experience, um, this can trigger something like that. But then you need a strong activation of the limbic system via the emotional content of the event. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is not imprinting. This is a different mechanism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Jennifer had a question. How do you explain the pointing task actually to the monkey? I would understand that you can explain, show it yeah. to that um, point, but but how do you tell it how to wait for five seconds and so on? How do you get the instructions to a monkey? Yeah. 
this is this is an appetitive learning. So whenever he's doing something right, uh, it gets some orange juice, uh, and and they just love orange juice, and so they they work on that, and and they they really like the test. So this is this is a nice experiment, so to say. At least the monkey gets reward all the time if he if he does the right thing. And um, in principle, training a monkey on a visual task like this is kind of easy because monkeys are at least the macaques are visual animals so they they use very much for orientation their visual senses if you want to train the same monkey to an auditory task it takes like years oh <laughs> I, so i know um, i know colleagues who trained a monkey on an auditory task for let's say one and a half years uh, before they could even start the experiment wow wow really hard yes. So Frauke uh, was asking, can associations be lost again? So if the dog hears the, uh, the bell ring multiple times without re receiving food, will it stop associating these things with each other? Absolutely. Well, this is what we call extinction learning. So, I mean, the, the brain, the major task of the brain is to always adapt to its surrounds as optimal as possible. And that this includes for sure to forget things that are not relevant anymore. So mm -hmm. if anything that has been learned before and was relevant in some context is not relevant anymore in another context, then it's also, yeah, then there is extinction learning and, and you lose the knowledge again. It can then be usually be relearned faster and easier if then the context changes again and it's needful again. Um, but yeah, for, forgetting is also a very important mechanism in learning because it just get rid of uh, unimportant information. And then there's even a follow-up question. Uh, I have read about studies on drug addicts who still show very high activity in the reward center of the brain when looking at images of cocaine, even, even after years of being sober. For me, this would be an indication that it is really hard to lose associations once they are created. Yes, um, but this, this drug addiction is a special case, again, of a pathologic um, condition where, you know, the, the drugs, they interfere directly with the neurotransmission at the level of the synapses. This is how they work. And, and this is also why the, the whole system gets, um, gets out of any equilibrium it, it should have. And, and then it's really hard um, to get rid of that again. But this, is, this it has something to do with learning algorithms because these drugs interfere with the systems that are used for learning. Um, but it's not a, a normal learning as we know it. Yeah, let's say, what do I talk about today for central learning or, or whatever? So this is really a pathological condition and this is why it's so hard to get rid of it again. So there's another question by Ronak. With relation to the behavior of the brain while learning and storing categorical information, is there any relation to how muscle memory works? Is it similar and does it have and does brain have any role in this? I'm not quite sure what you mean by muscle memory. So um, if you mean um, some kind of motor processes, so how uh, a certain movement is, uh, is um, executed, for example, this is learned in, in the motor cortex, for example. So the, the areas of the brain that um, activate or make the motor programs and then activate the muscles, they learn as also the sensory systems learn. So there's no fundamental difference between that. It's just another task that the, this area of the brain has that makes the difference. But the learning mechanisms are the same. Interesting. So I I'm, sometimes have the feeling that if you learn to perceive certain things, it's very easy to remember them once you are faced again with the same stimulus. But let's say in language learning, if you understand stuff, then you will, this will recover very quickly. But the speaking, if you forget, let's say, words and different vocabulary, seems to recover much um, uh, not as fast. Is that, is that true? Or is that a personal experience? Or? So it's obviously a personal experience. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know if, uh, how are the statistics on that. So if, if you think about bicycle riding, for example, this is always mm -hmm. the example for motor skills that you learn and you, you never forget for your whole life usually. So if you know how to ride a bike, you will never 
uh, forget that. Um, so there is an, an, uh, a memory for these yeah, motor tasks also. And uh, sure, they, they fade a little bit, but usually uh, if you have to relearn something that you had already learned before, it's usually much faster than in the first, in the first round. Mm -hmm. Then we have one more question, and it's about the cat. Uh, is the vertically uh, is the vertically trained cat not able to see a horizontal stick, or is it not able to recognize a horizontal stick as such? I have the concept in mind that the actual image is generated in the brain, not in the eye, and if that fails, the overall image might be corrupted. Yeah, so. This is hard to imagine, uh, but the, the cat really doesn't see the, the, the horizontal bar because there are no neurons anymore that are activated by a horizontal bar. So it's, the, the cat is really blind for horizontal structures. So it's, it's completely in the image generated by the brain or in the self-perception image, these horizontal structures are completely missing. Yeah. So, so the, the, the cat was raised in a world that doesn't know horizontal structures. And mm -hmm. if then the critical period is over, it will never be able to see horizontal structures. Uh, similar effects can also be introduced by brain injuries, right? That you lose the ability to recognize faces and yeah. things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is again because of the specialization of different brain areas for different uh, functions. So if you, if you lose, let's say, um, the region where faces are stored, then you may lose the ability uh, to recognize faces. Um, they are very, very strange phenomena, depending on what kind or what, what area is, is really affected by a stroke or, or whatever. Yeah, I guess these phenomena would fill another lecture of yours. <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, these were all the questions that have been posted in the chat. So thank you very much for this very nice presentation. You see that there were plenty of questions, plenty of people joining this call. So you see that at least here in Erlangen in computer science, there is a lot of interest in neurobiology. And it's not like that the engineers say, oh, we don't care what you guys are doing. <laughs> but we'll just make it work on our own. <laughs> okay. So yeah. thank you very much. I have another round of applause for you. <laughs> thank you. Great. And this concludes our presentation here. Obviously, there were quite a few questions that were asked by the audience in the video, but of course, this doesn't end our discussion. So if you want to engage in the discussion, please go ahead and use the comment functionality, ask your questions, I will forward them to Holger and he will help me in replying to your questions. So I'd be glad if you would be asking some of the questions of the comments. And of course, you can also follow me on social media. So I will post my Twitter and LinkedIn details and there you can also engage me if you have any questions. So I hope you liked this little video and if you liked it, I would be very glad to welcoming you again in the next episode of Beyond the Patterns. So thank you very much for watching and bye bye.